Yep. That's it. So, David, have you seen anything positive from the noise coming out of this COP so far? So the COP process is in two parts. One is the official negotiations and the other is what we call the moment, where everybody is steaming around, forming little discussion groups, and I would say that is progressing extremely well. I don't think I've attended a COP meeting where there is so much enthusiasm and the understanding about the need for real action. But this is all in that moment, which is a critical part of the COP process because there's no other meeting where all this number of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people gather to discuss this one issue, climate change. Okay, and we've just heard that it's going to be extended till Sunday. And this, there's concern that this excludes a lot of the poorer nations who can't necessarily afford to stay on, etc., etc. In, when things like this happen, do you think the actual structure and the process of the COP is fit for purpose in terms of what it's trying to achieve? Uh, there's, there's very, very real difficulties with the United Nations process, 197 nations having to reach real consensus. A couple of nations can actually stop and block progress. And that, that always leads to lowest common denominator determining the way forward. So what, what we know is, whatever the outcome, it is likely that it's not going to be even close to managing the threat to humanity's future that climate change represents. So it's a dynamic process, it will carry on. But I'm really of the view that we need willing nations to get together and promote and carry forward real actions that are needed. Because if we don't do that, and have another five years of discussion, and then another five years, frankly, it'll be too late. Okay. And given that the public in both the US and the UK, which are just two examples, are over 70% in polling supportive of strong climate action, what can we do to meet the level of expectation to fix this whole climate issue? I mean, these, these polls are very, very encouraging. We've never had figures like that before. Um, what, what we need is, of course, deep and rapid emissions reduction. Now, at the moment, we're in a dreadful situation where prime ministers can make speeches around reaching net zero without any commitment or honesty about their, their process. Prime Minister of Australia is suddenly committing to net zero by 2050, but then also saying that we won't stop using coal. Bolsonaro in Brazil saying we're going to protect the forests when he has been responsible for the removal of all the protections put in place by his predecessors. So I, I think there's a, a lot of hypocrisy, but this also means that the, the word of other prime ministers is then brought into question. Now, I, I think we need a follow-up, a detailed follow-up process to see if country A has promised X that they are starting to, live, to deliver on that promise right away. We need an annual survey of what each country is doing. But we also need critically important standards set on how we analyze what each country is doing. And by critically important standards, what I mean is a, a fully quantitative process to look at how we measure carbon dioxide emissions, how we measure methane emissions, how we add the two together, NOx emissions, and how we analyze each country's performance. We need that to be an objective process set out quantitatively. And I'm very, very keen after this COP meeting to see that we progress with that, and certainly the Climate Crisis Advisory Group will be taking that on board. Okay, and there it is in a sense, it's been a criticism in the past that these processes have no teeth. And what you're saying is that somehow they need to be given the teeth to make sure these things are not just empty promises. Yes, to give them teeth, but also to expose hypocrisy. Right? We, we need the, the people of a country where a promise has been made by the head of government to know the government is or isn't doing what has been promised. Every country's feet has to be held to the fire, the leadership. Now, it's not just the leadership. We are all responsible. We set standards by which each other tend to live. And so by this I mean, actually, there's no excuse for us to be driving around in SUVs in cities like London and Los Angeles. 
there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be using more public transport. The, 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 the example being set when heads of government go flying off in private executive jets to nearby London or to nearby countries in Europe is not the right example. Right? So we, we are setting examples to others around the world. And by this I mean there's a rapidly emerging new middle class in Asia, Southeast Asia, in Africa, and they are looking at us as setting an example in terms of behavior. We really have to look at this very carefully in terms of how we act before we can expect others to. Okay, and in this decade, we now know that climate is here. Climate change, climate impacts, climate extremes are surrounding us. And the Climate Crisis Advisory Group is an agile process. Can you talk about how you're responding in this decade to what's emerging? Right, so the important thing about the Climate Crisis Advisory Group is we, we have four or five people who are currently IPCC authors. We're not an alternative at all, but we are agile. So we're producing monthly reports, we have monthly public meetings, and we are discussing current issues. We were the first group in the world to look at the extreme weather events around the recent summer in the Northern Hemisphere and relate them back to what was happening in the Arctic Circle region. The loss of ice in that region, meaning the North Pole is now one of the warmest regions in the Northern Hemisphere during those three months. Now, we, we related these extreme weather events to what is happening in the North Pole region, and we were the first to do that. And we, we did get a lot of interest around the world from the, from the media. Now, that, that is just the beginning. We, we will produce reports on what has happened to COP26, agreements made, how well or poorly they will match up to the needs of humanity going forward, by which I mean, what is the strategy for seeing that there is a real future for humanity well into the future? If the IPCC AR6 report out in August reports to us that ice on land is melting irreversibly, don't we have to take that on board? Are we actually saying that the next 20 years are the only years that matter for humanity? Or should we address our responsibility to a future for humanity stretching out thousands of years? Right? At the moment, we have no promise at all of humanity being able to operate in anything like its present form for more than 50 years into the future. And I, I think that there's a critically important pathway for Climate Crisis Advisory Group to be constructive about what needs to be done, to set out the challenge and then be constructive. We're not just here to scare people and say the world is really in a bad place. We're setting out a full series of targets that need all to be achieved. We've got a comprehensive strategy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.